I think people feel they either have to trust science and give up their spiritual urges, or they have to trust the spiritual urges and give up science and rationality. I think, you know, what we need is a way of bringing these two together. And I think that's what the panpsychist approach gives us. It doesn't say there are two realms. It doesn't say the consciousness or the spiritual stuff, if you want to go there, is is outside of the physical world. It says these are just two sides of the same coin. So that's what's very attractive. It gives us a sort of unified, elegant picture of the universe that leaves nothing out. Welcome to The Art of Humanity. I'm your host, Jessica Ann. This is my podcast where you can listen for fresh perspectives with artists, leaders, authors, and your favorite entrepreneurs. You can explore creativity and consciousness, evolve your business with The Art of Humanity. Now, here's this week's episode. Welcome to episode 62 of The Art of Humanity. My guest today aligns with my mission for a higher consciousness through an entirely new consciousness that he calls panpsychism. I first recorded this episode at the end of last year in November of 2019. And as I was re-listening to it to write and record this intro script, I realized just how medicinal this interview truly is. As we've progressed through these weird, crazy times, we continue to dive deeper into the uncertainty, and that's what this season is all about. And the more I grow, the less I know. And if you're looking for some good old-fashioned certainty or quote-unquote facts, this may not be the episode for you, because it completely uproots our understanding of the world. And I highly recommend that you listen to another episode. But if you thrive off of uncertainty like I do, then not knowing what's up or what's down, because we are mere mortals flying through space on a big blue marble, then I hope that this episode is like the comet or asteroid that you can latch onto, providing you temporary catharsis and respite as you cling to what's true. I love this conversation because it's the ticket to understanding the new science of consciousness. As this season has focused on uncertainty, I find it's important to imbue this uncertainty with more uncertainty. Yes, if you found me through the Dr. Jack Cruz episode, this takes a topic from an entirely different perspective, from neuroscience, and flips it on its head through philosophy. This interview is with a brilliant philosopher who teaches at Durham University. He wrote a compelling book called Galileo's Error. He argues that Galileo never thought that we could measure our way to the subjective experience of seeing a color. He knew that there were limits to what science can do. So what does that exactly mean for our humanity? That's what this podcast and Philip's book is all about. Philip offers an exciting alternative that could pave the way forward. Rooted in an analysis of the philosophical underpinnings of modern science, Goff makes the case for panpsychism, a theory which posits that consciousness is not confined to biological entities, but is a fundamental feature of all physical matter, from subatomic particles to the human brain. In his book, he provides the first step on a new path to the final theory of human consciousness. Thus, the title of his book, Galileo's Error, Foundations for a New Science of Consciousness. He shares some pretty incredible insights on what consciousness is. And this may be obvious, but I want to underline that Philip understands consciousness from the point of view of a philosopher, which is very different from neuroscience in Jack Crew's episode in episode 59, which is very different from, say, the neuroscientist episode 59 with Dr. Jack Cruz. But it's similar to the conversation that I had with Dr. Teresa Bullard in episode 45, where we discuss how the art and science of alchemy can make us a superhuman. As an explorer of consciousness myself, it's helpful to interview brilliant thinkers from across multiple industries and paradigms so that we can imbue our thoughts and beliefs and experiences with this multidimensional perspective. I got this visual the other day in meditation, and it's like whether we believe in a god or gods or a higher power or a universal life force, I love the conversations where we can ask, what color is your rope? We are climbing these invisible ropes up to a higher power, and I'm fascinated by the different colors that we all climb. 
In this interview, we discuss why consciousness is the experience or what it is like to be you, why the movie Being John Malkovich is an experiential interpretation of empathy, how empathy relates to the interpretation of consciousness, why people remain resistant to challenging materialism. We also discuss why we need to rethink what science is all about, the meaning of panpsychism, how time travel helps us to reimagine the mind and the world around us. If you love this podcast, please give it a review in the Apple Store or share it with two of your friends. Now, let's go to the show. Welcome to The Art of Humanity, where we explore creativity and consciousness with artists, leaders, authors, and entrepreneurs. Today, I'm so excited to talk with Philip Goff. Philip is a philosopher who argues that the traditional approaches of materialism and dualism face insuperable difficulties. Materialism is the view that consciousness can be explained in terms of physical processes in the brain, whereas dualism is the view that consciousness is separate from the body and brain. On the basis of this, Philip defends a form of panpsychism, the view that consciousness is a fundamental and ubiquitous feature of the physical world. It sounds a bit crazy, but Philip offers a compelling argument that avoids the difficulties faced by its rivals. Philip, thank you so much for joining me on the show. Thanks a lot. Thanks for having me on. It's great to chat to you. Philip, you dive in deep and possibly you've even dedicated most of your professional life to an existential concern, which you document in depth in your book, Galileo's Era, Foundations for a New Science of Consciousness. And it's truly revelatory. Throughout this season, I've been interviewing experts in the field of consciousness, and your findings are probably one of the most compelling because it isn't just navel-gazing, at least that's what I'm telling my navel, (laughs) but your perspective is now pioneering a new way to explore our humanity through the lens a somewhat flawed philosophical argument made all the way back by Galileo, which coincidentally no one has ever disputed. So I find this fascinating, and I'd love to start with the definition thing, because we can really just go off into the ethers with this topic right off the bat. But let's just start on a pretty grounded level by talking about the different definitions of consciousness. From my interview with Jim Rutt in episode 54, who he believes that consciousness is no different than digestion, to the episode with Richard Rudd in episode 35, who believes that the future of human consciousness is going beyond the mind. So let's come full circle to this conversation and we'll experience maybe a bit of a paradox and irony using our minds to go back in time to understand Galileo's definition and kind of how we've arrived at where we are today. So I'll hand it over to you and so thrilled to see where our conversation leads. Yeah, well, thanks for your kind words. Um, Yeah, I think it's a really good place to start, actually, as you say, just with the definition of consciousness, because it's actually quite an ambiguous word. And often people use it to mean something quite sophisticated, like self-awareness, awareness of your own existence. This might be something, you know, we might be reluctant to ascribe to certain non-human animals, like is a sheep aware of its own existence? That's not so clear. But actually, the way I use it, the way we tend to use it in the philosophy of consciousness and in much of the science, is just to mean something kind of more simple in a way. Consciousness is just experience. Consciousness is what it's like to be you. Right now, you're having an auditory experience of my voice speaking to you and a visual experience of the room around you. And if you attend more closely, probably, you know, a tactile experience of the chair beneath you. These are all parts of your consciousness, part of what it's like to be you. So actually, some people say consciousness is a mystery. The mystery is we don't know what consciousness is. I don't agree with that way of putting it. I think it's quite straightforward what it is. I've just told you what it is. It's just what it's like to be you right now. The mystery really is how that fits in to our scientific story of the universe, right? If you study neuroscience, I'm not a neuroscientist, but I work a lot with neuroscientists and I'm fascinated by it. But if you study neuroscience, you'll learn about neuronal firings and action potentials and calcium chambers and various neurotransmitters. And overall, you'll get a very complicated story of electrochemical signaling in the brain. But on the face of it, what you won't learn about feelings, emotions, experiences. In fact, it seems like the whole story of the brain we get from neuroscience could, could function perfectly well in, completely in the absence of feelings or experiences. And so we're left with this deep mystery. Why does experience exist at all? So this is how I like to put it to sum it up. The mystery is 
how does what we know about ourselves from the inside fit together with what science tells us about the brain from the outside? This is this really deep mystery that we really haven't even got to the beginnings of addressing yet. So that's really the problem. I love it. And it's so interesting that we can kind of absorb this new way of seeing through the world through our feelings. And I think it's interesting because I don't know if you study Myers-Briggs, but I was kind of blown away when I discovered this methodology because it allows you to see how people are interpreting reality. If you do have a feeling in your chart, as Myers-Briggs was coined by these two women, Myers with last name, one last name Meyer, one last name Briggs, and they kind of came together to form this way of looking through the world. And as a feeler, it kind of allows us to kind of tap into that a little more and look through the lens of other people's perspectives. And it's a little bit tricky to explain. And I find that one of the best ways to do it, which you do in your book, is through the movie Being John Malkovich. I don't know if any of my listeners have seen this movie, but it's a cult classic from the 90s. And the characters find themselves experiencing what it's like to be the real life actor being John Malkovich, looking out of his eyes and hearing out of his ears. And the characters adopt the conscious perspective of John Malkovich. And this movie, going back to what I was saying earlier about like being a feeler through this world, this movie is kind of groundbreaking because as people who do feel through the world and live this way, seeing the world through another's eyes, you realize that not everyone interprets the world this way. And that's when I realized that this movie is almost an experiential interpretation of empathy. So how does empathy relate to this interpretation of consciousness? Absolutely. Yeah, I think that's a very good way of putting it. I mean, and I think maybe this is another way. What I'm always keen to emphasize in my work is this is not just another scientific problem. You know, a lot of people, although this problem is taken very seriously now, it's generally agreed, and this wasn't always the case, it's generally agreed that consciousness does pose this profound challenge for science. But still, a lot of people think, well, we just need to plug away with our standard ways of investigating the brain and we'll solve it. But I think there are many ways in which it's very different to an ordinary scientific problem. And I think what you were talking about there points to it in a way, because physical science tries to give a completely objective description of reality. The philosopher Thomas Nagel famously put it by saying, physics tries to capture the view from nowhere, as if you're outside of space and time and just a completely objective description. So if there were aliens who came from another planet, Maybe they'd have very different sense organs to us. Maybe they wouldn't be able to understand our art or our music. But if they were intelligent enough to understand mathematics, they could understand our physics. Whatever your life experience, you can understand physics. It's utterly objective. Whereas consciousness, in contrast, I think this connects to what you were just saying, consciousness is subjective. You can only understand someone's consciousness by adopting their perspective as it were, getting inside their head, like so well presented in the movie, being John Malkovich, where these characters go down this weird tunnel and find themselves looking (laughs) out of his eyes, hearing out of his ears. That would be Mm -hmm. a stranger film. Hey, it's quite possible. (laughs) (laughs) Learning what it's like to be John Malkovich. So there's a real clash here between this drive of physical science to be utterly objective, but with consciousness, be subjective. You have to adopt the perspective. So philosopher Thomas Nagel, again, famously said, you know, no matter how much we learn about the physiology of bats through conventional science, we'll never know what it's like to be a bat. Echolocate their way around the world, they squeal and the the sound bounces off the walls and manage to navigate the world in this way. This is such an alien way of getting around the world. Or even a dog, you know, smelling its way around the world. We don't know what it's like to adopt that perspective. And so Nagel said, you know, no matter how much we learn about the physiology of bats in objective scientific terms, there'll always be some information missed out, namely what it's like to be the bat. So this is one way of understanding that the depth of the challenge, that what science is aiming for with its objectivity is in a sense ill-formulated for trying to incorporate consciousness into our scientific picture of things. So that's one way of seeing how deep this challenge is, I think. It's a huge Um, challenge. I mean, especially... I think I read somewhere that academia, when you were writing about this, when you were in academia, they cautioned you about writing about this topic of panpsychism. 
So what led you to completely dismiss the idea that consciousness is dynamically opposed to the materialist definition of consciousness? And I find it interesting that people are cautioning you not to go this route of panpsychism, and it's kind of frowned upon in the academic circles today. So can you talk yeah. a little bit about that? Well, actually, things have changed so much. Yeah, as you say, when I was finished my PhD and I was looking for jobs in 2006, 2007, and well-meaning professors said to me, maybe don't talk about the panpsychism. You know, you might struggle to get a job. But actually, so much has changed in the last 10 or 15 years. And um, it's now become a well-respected minority still view. But it's gone from being something that was laughed at insofar as it was thought about at all to being a view that's taken very seriously. And, you know, I have graduate students from all over the world coming to work with me on this. And it's really exciting how much has changed so quickly. If you just have a slightly broader perspective, for much of the 20th century, consciousness was just a taboo topic. It wasn't seen as appropriate subject matter for real science. And I've mm -hmm. heard people who, you know, struggle to get jobs because they wanted to work on consciousness, just not even panpsychism. Just... So I think from mm -hmm. the 1990s, things have changed and it's now being taken much more seriously and things are changing so quickly. What I try to press actually, and I guess this connects to the Galileo stuff, I think the reason people are still resistant to challenges to materialism is because they think, well, look how successful physical science has been. It's explained so much of our universe. It's produced wonderful technology. Of course, this is going to, should give us confidence that it's going to explain consciousness. But try to present work is, I think this relies on a sort of misunderstanding of the history of science. Yes, physical science has been so successful, but it's been so successful precisely because it was designed to exclude consciousness. So a key moment in the scientific revolution is Galileo's declaration that mathematics is to be the language of the new science. The new science is to have a purely quantitative vocabulary. But Galileo understood quite well that you can't capture consciousness in these terms because consciousness is an essentially qualitative, quality-involving phenomenon. If you just think about the redness of a red experience, or the smell of coffee, or the taste of mint, you can't capture these kind of qualities in the, in the purely quantitative vocabulary of physical science. Galileo was very clear on this. So he said, right, what we need to do, if we want a mathematical science, we need to take consciousness outside of the domain of science. So Galileo said, right, that's in the soul. That's nothing to do with science. Let's just focus on what we can capture in mathematics. Once we've taken consciousness out, we can just do everything else with math. So that was the start of mathematical physics. And that's gone incredibly well. What we've forgotten is that it was never intended as a complete account of reality. The whole project was premised on putting consciousness outside of science. This is important because people think, oh, it's gone so well. Of course, it's going to explain consciousness. Actually, the irony is it's gone so well because it was designed to exclude consciousness. You know, if Galileo time traveled to the present day and heard about this problem of explaining consciousness in the terms of physical science, he'd say, of course you can't do that. I designed physical science to deal with quantities, not qualities. I designed it for a very limited task. It's done well at that limited task, but that task was never about explaining consciousness. So I think really... If we now want a science of consciousness, we've got to really rethink what science is all about. That's what I'm trying to make sense of as a philosopher. Sorry, that was a bit long-winded, wasn't it? I got a bit carried away. No, I love it. It's, so, it's I love it. It's super fascinating. And you're right. I mean, as you share in your book, science and philosophy rarely prove anything with 100% certainty. We can't prove with any certainty that we're not in the matrix being fed a virtual reality by evil computers. We can't prove that the world didn't spontaneously come into existence five minutes ago, as Bertrand Russell pointed out, as you write on uh, page 84 of your book. And I love this like thinking because we are basing our current reality on a foundation that's flawed. And as you mentioned, Galileo focused on quantity and not quality. So now you're kind of revolutionizing the way that we see and interpret the world by saying that, wait, the Consciousness as we know and love it is flawed. And here's a new way of looking at it um, and really basing all of your findings in your book on this new interpretation of consciousness. So why is this so important to, I mean, besides the obvious that like our whole reality is structured a certain way and then we're kind of flipping it upside down, how can like everyday people who might be listening to this 
contemplate on this or use it in their everyday existence. Yeah, absolutely. So yeah, I mean, I sort of think we're currently going through a phase of history where we're so blown away by the success of physical science and the wonderful technologies produced that we feel inclined to think, that's everything. We finally found something that works. And that leads to a nice sense of certainty. You know, people talk about religion being a crutch, but in a way, I think a certain kind of view of science can be a crutch, you know, that you feel, oh, I know where the answers lie. We haven't got them all yet, but we know how to find them. And I think part of what we've forgotten is that there, there is a philosophy behind science. It was designed by Galileo. He wasn't just a great scientist. He was also a great philosopher. And he designed a philosophical worldview in which science was going to take place. Um, that worldview essentially put consciousness outside of the physical world, right? And if we now want to bring consciousness back into the physical world, I think we really need to rethink the worldview that science has been operating for the past 300 or 400 years. So maybe I could start with just how the panpsychist picture does reimagine things and then come back to your question of what does it mean for or anyone just thinking about this in general. Perfect. That, yeah. That be a good yeah, let's do it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So the starting point of the panpsychist is that physical science doesn't really tell us what matter is. And that's a kind of, that seems like a really bizarre claim at first. You know, you read a physics textbook, you seem to learn all these incredible things about the nature of space and time and matter. Philosophers of science have realized is that for all its richness, physics is actually confined to telling us about the behavior of matter about what it does, right? So, you know, physics tells us, for example, that matter has mass and charge. Part of the reason there's been a revival of interest in this view is, is the rediscover certain important work from the 1920s by the philosopher Bertrand Russell and the scientist Arthur Eddington, who was incidentally um, the first scientist to confirm Einstein's general theory of relativity after the First World War. So I'm inclined to think these guys did in the 1920s for the science of consciousness what Darwin did in the 19th century for the science of life. And it's a tragedy of history that it's, it was so forgotten about for so long, but it's actually very recently been rediscovered in academic philosophy and is causing a lot of excitement and interest. And, and part of what I was trying to do with this popular book is to try and get that out to a broader audience because, you know, things are so specialized these days. There can be an idea that's causing lots of excitement in a certain area of philosophy, but nobody outside of philosophy knows about it. So this is what I was trying to do with the book. And that's why I'm bringing you so, on, because this stuff is important. But a lot of the times philosophers just sit around and talk to each other. So I love yeah, that's why exactly. I love bringing you out into the world like this. So thank you. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It annoys me so much that philosophers just talk to themselves and, you know, there's it's so much of a need to connect to the general public, but also to connect to scientists. You know, this is an interdisciplinary task. So if we're going to fill in the details of this, we're, we're really going to have to do it as a scientific community. It's going to have to be a labor of an interdisciplinary labor. So the starting point of Russell and Eddington is that physics doesn't really tell us what matter is. And that seems like a kind of bizarre claim at first. You read a physics textbook, you seem to learn all these incredible things about the nature of space and time and matter. But actually, what Russell and Eddington realized is that for all its richness, physics is confined to telling us about the behavior of matter, what it does. So, you know, physics tells us, for example, that matter has mass, charge, and these properties are completely defined in terms of behavior. You know, mass is about gravitational attraction and resistance to acceleration. Charge is about attraction and repulsion. This is all about what stuff does. Physics tells us absolutely nothing about what philosophers like to call the intrinsic nature of matter, what matter is, right? So it tells us what it does. It doesn't tell us what it is. And so actually, there's this huge hole in our scientific story of the universe. The proposal of the panpsychist is to put consciousness in that hole. So the idea is there's just matter, particles, fields, nothing kind of supernatural, but matter can be described from two perspectives. Physical science describes it, as it were, from the outside in terms of its behavior, gives us rich information about what it does, but consciousness from the inside, consciousness in its intrinsic nature, is constituted of forms of consciousness. This is the beautiful, simple way of bringing together what we know about ourselves from the inside in terms of our awareness of our feelings and experiences and what science tells us about matter from the outside, bringing it together in a single unified picture of the world. 
that's really the vision that's driving all of this. It's a new way of thinking about the universe we live in. And I love that panpsychism is being taken a lot more seriously over the years in both philosophy and science. As you mentioned, it's just so important to reflect back on physics. And you quoted someone earlier who says physics tries to capture the view from nowhere. And it's like, wait, yeah. I'm curious, as you're talking, I'm trying to make sense. I love the etymology of words and panpsychism. I don't necessarily, I'd like to understand a little better about what pan, like the etymology of the word. For me, I think of Peter Pan and I think of like, <laughs> like flying and just like using your imagination. And like, he just was such a child, had so much childlike wonder and awe for the world. And it's almost like bringing that intuitive knowing of the mystery of the universe into something a lot like logic and science. Yeah, that's a very nice way of saying it. So yeah, I mean, I mean, just from the etymology, pan means everything, and psyche means mind. So literally, it means everything has mind. Mind is everywhere. But it, it actually doesn't literally. Mean, I mean, or at least in its contemporary form, contemporary panpsychists don't literally think that everything is conscious. The basic commitment is that the fundamental building blocks of reality, perhaps fundamental particles like electrons and quarks, have unimaginably simple forms of experience, and that the very complex experience of the human or animal brain is somehow formed from the very simple consciousness of its most basic parts. Um, so it doesn't mean that every random collection of things is conscious. It doesn't mean that my socks are conscious or a rock <laughs> is conscious, but it does mean that my socks made out of very little things themselves conscious. Um, mm. You know, so I, I suppose it's important also to emphasize another common misunderstanding. We're not saying that electrons, you know, have thoughts like human beings do. You know, it's not like they're sitting there having existential angst. Remember, by consciousness, we're just meaning experience. Mm -hmm. And humans have very rich and complex experience, horses less so, mice less so again. As you keep on getting to simpler and simpler forms of life, you get simpler and simpler forms of experience. Now, it could be that at some point the lights switch off and consciousness disappears. But according to panpsychism, that continuum of consciousness fading whilst never quite disappearing continues on into inorganic matter with the simplest constituents of the world perhaps fundamental particles, having unimaginably simple forms of experience. So, so, so experience is there, pervades the universe, experience is there from the start. And what we have is natural selection over millions of years has molded these simple forms of consciousness into the incredibly rich and complex forms that human beings enjoy in every second of waking life. Every time I hit publish on a new episode of my podcast, I'm filled with such immense gratitude for the ability to co-create at this time in history. Those on this shared path of co-creation are ushering in a new consciousness on this planet. It's a new state of being with a capital B versus the old paradigm of doing. Many of us humans need a manual on how to simply exist. Podcasting is one way to broadcast our light. It's a way to activate our human potential and bring in business. My team and I have created results for our clients like a six-figure deal with Spotify within one year of launch, getting ranked as an Apple new and notable, deals with iHeartRadio and Himalaya, Stitcher has even promoted our podcasts to climb the charts. We're creating success for podcast hosts from all over the world while working smarter, not harder. If you're looking to take the mystery out of podcasting and want to start or scale your podcast into a globally recognized media empire, go to go.artofhumanity.io slash masterclass to learn more about my profitable podcast masterclass. Again, that's go.artofhumanity.io slash masterclass. Now back to the interview. I want to get back to something you mentioned earlier about time travel. In your book, you mentioned that you explain it really practically in your book, and you explain that time travel is possible. We just can't go back in time to change anything. Can you speak to that a little bit? Because when I read that, I was like, that just makes sense. That just seems so practical to me. And how you explained it in your book is very 
practical as well. So, and you know, it's something like time travel. People who are like super scientific and logical are probably like, wow, where is this conversation going right now? <laughs> but <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think well, I talked about that in the book. It was a book about consciousness. But I suppose what I was trying to say is some people think, don't understand what the role of philosophy is. You know, you think to find out about the world, to find out about the universe, we look to science. But what I want to try to show is there is a real role for philosophy in finding out about the universe. Because sometimes we have an oversimplistic view of science, like it's just doing the experiments and getting the data. But sometimes great evolution in science involves reimagining the world, reimagining the universe around us. And I think this is the skill that philosophers are particularly good at. So my hunch is, you know, making progress on consciousness isn't going to be just about doing more neuroscience, important as that is. It's going to be about reimagining how we understand the mind and the brain and how we understand the connection between them. But the other thing philosophers are really good at is, mm. is working out when things don't make sense. <laughs> you know? There are some things that obviously mm-hmm. don't make sense, like square circles <laughs> or married yeah. bachelors. It's just a contradiction that anyone can see. Some things don't make sense in a more subtle way. So I think what there is a broad consensus among philosophers about, you know, you think philosophers never agree with each other, but actually there's certain areas where there's quite a bit of consensus. It's not too dissimilar to economics. There's a lot of disagreement in economics, but there's a lot of, there are portions of agreement as well. So what there is a broad consensus on with respect to time travel is that the idea of changing the past doesn't make sense. When you really think it through, it seems to make sense at first. We can watch these movies like Back to the Future where The characters seem to, Marty McFly stops his parents meeting and then he starts to disappear. He starts to fade out of existence. But actually, when you really think it through, it doesn't make sense. There are a couple of different views of time. One view of time is just that Mm -hmm. the only thing that exists is the present moment. The past is dead and gone. The future is yet to be. The only thing that exists is the present moment. Now, if you have that view of time, Mm -hmm. time travel is impossible because the past doesn't exist. You can't go somewhere that doesn't exist. You can't go to the planet Vulcan because... But can you go to the planet Vulcan Spartan? Just kidding. That's a callback to another episode I listened with uh, Jim Rutt. (laughs) (laughs) All right. It's like a game B type of world that we're creating in the future. So maybe we have to create it in order to go to it. (laughs) All right. Oh, yeah. Are you giving me some good references here that I should follow through? Yeah, so if you want to believe in time travel, you need to have the view that all Mm -hmm. times, this is sometimes called eternalism. Presentism is the view that only the present exists. Eternalism is the view that all moments of time exist equally. So 1000 BC, 2000 years ago, or the far future with Martian colonies, human colonies on Mars, all moments in time exist equally. And if you think there's something special about your time, 2020, <laughs> you're just kind of time racist. You're just, that's just your time, you know? There's not, nothing special about your time. So this is kind of a crazy view, but, but it's taken very seriously because a lot of people think Einstein's mm-hmm. theory of special relativity presses in that direction. Mm-hmm. Okay, so you've got to have that view of time. If you have that view of time, you could travel in time, you could travel to the past, but you couldn't change the past because the idea is you've got all the, all the events in time laid out there. Imagine God looking down at all the events in time. So God looks at ancient Egypt. Mm. Either there are pyramids there yeah. or there aren't, right? So if we have a time travel story where someone goes back and stops the pyramids being built, maybe they kill all the people, then God looks down at time and what does he see? You know, he's looking down at all, all of time. Either there are pyramids in ancient Egypt or there aren't. We want to have this idea that sort of in the first history, the first run of history, there were pyramids. And in the second run of history, there weren't. But when you're thinking about all of time, that just doesn't make sense. So I think when you really think it through, the idea of changing the past doesn't make sense. It doesn't mean you can't travel to the past. There are some really good sci-fi time travel films like the first Terminator movie or a a really good Spanish film Mm -hmm. that everyone should check out called Time Crimes, where characters travel Mm -hmm. to the past, but nothing changes. There's no idea of changing the past. As long as you don't change anything, then it's perfectly consistent. It's when we have these time travel stories like Back to the Future where you change the past. That just doesn't make any sense. So, of course, once we have this idea, though, that just the final thing that we can't change the past, you might think this leads to all sorts of problems with free will. The time traveler goes to the past and it's fixed. How can they do anything? Does this limit their free will? So there are all (laughs) sorts of paradoxes and it's horribly complicated. But at least there's consensus on that worry about that view that when you really think it through, it doesn't really make sense to change the past. And I think we need some more of those skills when we're thinking about consciousness. What views, maybe there are some views that when you really think about it, 
it just doesn't really make sense. Totally. I mean, you bring up a good point because we can't deny the fact that pyramids exist. We know that they exist. They were just created during a time a long time ago. And we can speculate on how they got built and transformed, but we can't deny that they're there, correct? Yeah, absolutely. I suppose, yeah. I mean, that's what science is trying to capture, ultimately, this picture of the truth. The truth is out there, and we're, we're trying to find out what it is. But, but part of truth is what people feel and what people experience. That's kind of subjective because it's to do with you, but it's part of objective reality. It's a fact of the matter whether someone's in pain or not. So I guess what we're trying to do in the science of consciousness is to try and how does consciousness fit into that objective story of reality that science is trying to uncover? And it is a challenge. How to, you know, I suppose there are broadly three approaches to consciousness. Some people think it's so magical and mysterious, we'll never fit it into science. The polar opposite view is, well, there's some problems, just carry on with our standard ways of investigating the brain, we'll sort it out. I think my approach is a kind of middle way. I think we can have confidence that we can bring consciousness into the domain of science, but we need to rethink what science is. The science that Galileo bequeathed to us was not designed for this purpose. So if we want to bring consciousness into science, we need to move to a more expansive conception of the scientific method, one that incorporates both the objective quantitative features of reality, mathematical features of reality, that science has been doing so well with for the past 400 years, but also the subjective qualitative reality of consciousness that each of us knows in our own case. So I think what we're essentially calling for is the new scientific revolution, a new way of thinking about the scientific method. What's really exciting is that this is already starting to happen, as I describe in the book, as scientists and philosophers come together to lay the foundations for this new approach to consciousness. So it's a really exciting time. You know, mm -hmm. Things are changing really quickly. Totally. And back to your point about truth and truth is a subjective experience. I love that interpretation because it really gives freedom to our experiences and allowing our interpretation and intuition to come into play. And when you talk about time travel and all this fun stuff to think about, I like to think that time travel, like I remember when I was a little girl, I was with my dad and I went to some office and on the wall of his office was this quote. And I don't remember the exact quote, but it had something to do with different dimensions and had to do with time travel and the fact that like we are all a part of time, but we're just experiencing it through different dimensions. How does that pertain? And I just keep going and I kept keep asking my dad, I'm like, where was this office? Was this real? Was this a dream? But I just remember like reading that quote. I think I might have been like nine or ten. And then feeling the truth of that reality, that interpretation of reality, like deep within my bones. And I was like, wow, that's truth. That's my truth. I can feel that on a deep level that there are multiple dimensions of reality that are out there. And this is only just one interpretation of it that we are being told, which is the scientific logical realm. But then I had this awakening at a young age, so to speak, after reading this quote that I realized that there are these multiple dimensions that we can also access at any point in our time. Yeah, no, that sounds very really interesting. I wonder what, that, wonder what the quote was. Yeah, I mean, I think in a way it's, I mean, we can argue about all sorts of things like all sorts of, you know, what we believe is real or what we don't believe is real. But, you know, one thing that the most undeniable thing I think is the reality of your own experience. You know, if you're in pain, <laughs> you know, you know, you're in pain, you know, it's maybe I'm in the matrix, as you said earlier, you know, maybe the whole world is an illusion. But I certainly know that I'm conscious. I certainly know that I'm, maybe there isn't really a table in front of, maybe it's just the evil computers making me experience a table when really it's an <laughs> illusion. But I know I'm having an experience of a table. So this is what Rene Descartes, the father of modern philosophy, modern Western philosophy at least, you know, famously said, I think therefore I am. What he meant by that was the thing we are most certain of, the foundation, the starting point for knowledge is our own consciousness. That's the thing we're most certain of. The external world is one remove. We know about it through our experiences of it. But our own consciousness is the thing that's most evident, which what makes it most shocking, actually, that our official scientific picture of the world, in my view, does not have a place for consciousness. Mm -hmm. The thing that is consciousness, the thing that is not only the most certain thing, but I think it's fundamental. It's at the root of human identity. 
we fundamentally relate to each other as conscious beings with feelings and emotions. And it's arguably the basis of everything that's important in human existence. And yet, official scientific story we're taught doesn't have a place for consciousness. I think that can lead to a sense of alienation. We know we have feelings and emotions, but we're told all that's going on in there is electrochemical signaling. And I think those two things, we struggle to see how they fit together. So I think this can lead to a sense that, you know, we don't belong to the universe. Max Weber in the 19th century talked about the disenchantment of nature, this bleak picture that got this essentially mechanistic universe and mechanistic picture of the natural world and the cold immensity of empty space. You know, we can feel like this is an alien place. We don't belong. <laughs> Whereas I think, you know, what the panpsychist view gives us is a picture of the universe where we're conscious creatures in a conscious universe. It also brings that story, fits it. It doesn't deny the scientific worldview. It doesn't deny the mathematical story that science is giving us and that served us so well. Mm -hmm. But it has a way of bringing that together with the reality of our experience and our identity as we know it from the inside. And, you know, it was a real revelation to me to actually learn about this view when I was actually, when I was a philosophy undergraduate student, we were taught that the only two options were kind of materialism, you think it's just about the chemistry of the brain, or dualism, where you think it's something non-physical outside of the brain. And I came to think both of these views were pretty problematic and wrote my end of degree dissertation saying the problem of consciousness is irresolvable. And I just went off and did something else. <laughs> I just tried to forget about it, you know, it just keeping me awake at night. <laughs> but I happened upon this view, panpsychism, that sounds kind of crazy, mm -hmm. but avoids the deep difficulties of, um, you know, the more conventional options. And that manages to bring together what we know and what we value about human beings with the truths of science. And that was a revelation to me to just feel I can bring together what I know about myself from the inside. Mm -hmm together with the objective realities of science. And that, that's what it's all about to me. <laughs> totally. And I just shuddered when you said the word Max Weber, because my subjective experience was, and this is nothing against him, but it's my subjective experience from my sophomore year in college. I had a professor who used the Socrates method and we studied Max Weber and I'm still scarred from hearing that name. I'm just, I'm back in that classroom, like just like totally shuddering and hoping he didn't call my name and like trying to understand what Max Weber was trying to explain. And like, I don't know. So it's yeah. funny. We're talking about subjective experience. <laughs> I don't blame you. I'm not an expert on Max Weber. And I, I find that very dense 19th century German philosophy pretty challenging myself. So I don't blame you. But I guess he had that, that he was on to something about this idea of he thought it actually had a book, the, the Protestant Ethic and the Spirit of Capitalism. He had this idea of, yeah, this, mm -hmm. it was mapped up with you know, how he saw how the economy and our idea of science giving us this disenchantment from the universe. And I suppose it also comes, I guess, with, with globalization. When you only know about your own culture, you can think the ways of your culture are sort of the ways of the universe. The philosopher David Hume talked about how we gild and stain the world with our sentiment. You project your own cultural ideas on the world. And, you, and if you don't know about other cultures, you can think, oh, that's the universe makes sense because it has my cultural identity. But then you learn about other cultures and you learn actually your own cultural identity is just contingent and it could have been different and it's not how reality is. And, you know, that can mm -hmm. lead you to feel like, where am I in this universe? There's deep questions there that I don't have all the answers to. But I think if we have this picture that we are conscious creatures in a conscious universe, then at least it's a picture of the universe that we're in some way a little bit more at home in, a little bit more comfortable in our own skin. Well, that's the hope anyway. Yeah. And that, that's what's led me to really become more comfortable in my skin, as you just said. And hopefully it'll lead listeners to feel the same way as just knowing that there is more to the eye and to the body and to the mind than what we are told and that what we can see. And it is these mystical experiences. And I think a lot of what's going through the fabric of our culture right now is the interpretation of our mystical experiences. And whether we do that through psychedelics, whether we do that through reading cool books like yours, or whether we do that through, you know, dreaming or meditating, we are all trying to explore the mind and the psyches of how we think and how we're wired. And, you know, we are becoming more aware and awake to these mystical experiences. And I know towards the end of your book, you explain how we can interpret the implications for our human existence through the lens of these 
very different and nuanced and subjective mystical experiences that some of us may be having. So how does that align with kind of your findings? Yeah, so I suppose, I mean, this is the somewhat experimental final chapter of my book. I always want to emphasize that, you know, so most of my book is, and most of the people defending, you know, panpsychism has these sort of mystical associations, which is fine. But also a lot of the, you know, there's been this revival of interest in panpsychism and a lot of the philosophers defending it, like David Chalmers or Luke Roloffs, are just, you know, complete atheists who don't believe in anything spiritual, but they believe in consciousness because, you know, it's so undeniable that, uh, you know, there's feelings and experiences and they want to know how that fits into science. And they think panpsychism looks to be a good possibility for this. So it's not necessarily connected with anything spiritual. Nonetheless, if for independent reasons you do, you know, have certain spiritual views, then I think panpsychism is a picture of the world that can fit well with those. So, you know, so for example, I've never had a mystical experience myself, but you know, in all cultures, in all times, many times throughout history, people have mystical experiences. You know, whatever you think about it, it's the truth of it. It's a well-documented psychological state. You know, I think it's still very good, the, the classic psychological study by William James mm-hmm. in the, uh, the varieties of religious experience. Mm-hmm. You know, and in these experiences, people claim that there is this sort of unconditioned universal consciousness underlying all things and underlying the mind of the meditator and indeed the mind of every person and underlying all of reality. Now, if you're a materialist, you've got to think that's a delusion, right? You've got to think this must be, <laughs> this must be something funny going on. And I guess that's the, the approach a lot of people take. That's a crazy person. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Because you think this doesn't fit with, you know, this is telling me that the fundamental story of reality is this weird, this universal consciousness, but I look to physics and it's telling me there's particles and fields, you know, they don't fit together. Mm -hmm. If you're a panpsychist though, there is a way of fitting these together because for the panpsychist, you know, physics is great, but it's not telling us what matter is. It's telling us what it does. It's not telling us what a field is. It's telling us what it does. Mm -hmm. It doesn't say what an electron is. It says what, how it behaves. It's silent on the intrinsic nature of matter. So if you do believe in mystical experiences, then you can say what is discovered by the meditator when they silence their mind is a universal aspect of the intrinsic nature of matter. And I, I cash out a sort of a way of thinking about this in terms of a certain interpretation of physics. But one of our most successful contemporary theory, quantum field theory, the idea is that the universe is filled with fields, universe-wide fields, and particles are sort of excitations in those fields. So, you know, if you do trust mystical experiences and you're panpsychist, you can think that actually this reality of universal consciousness that the meditator discovers is actually the intrinsic nature of those fields that fill the universe. So it's a way of bringing it together, removing any sense of a clash between a belief in the truth of mystical experiences and a belief in the scientific picture. They're just saying different things. The scientific picture describes fields from the outside. The mystical experience tells you their nature from the inside. Now, of course, you know, I've never had a mystical experience. I meditate every day, actually. 20 minutes every morning. Mm-hmm. I've not as yet had a mystical experience. So I, so I remain somewhat agnostic, you know, mm-hmm. on on whether they are actual, uh, these experiences. But I think panpsychism, it doesn't give you reason to believe in them, but it removes the reason to doubt them. Mm-hmm. And that's quite significant. That's really cool. So do you think that your work would change if you did have a mystical experience? Wow, that's a really good question. Maybe I should go and take some ayahuasca or something. It's hard to do when you've got young kids to take a, a few days away to... Anything. Yeah, well, I do think there is perhaps... You know, cause I suppose people do think there's, there's something um, suspicious about trusting mystical experiences. But, it, you know, in a way, all of our knowledge is built on trusting experience. You know, as we've said a few times already, I don't know for sure I'm in whether I'm in the Matrix... I trust my experiences. You know, I have an experience that suggests there's a table in front of me. 
And I trust that experience. I can't prove it, but I, all knowledge is built on trusting experiences. And so actually, William James, most of the chapter on mystical experiences is a description of them. But towards the end, he considers whether it would be rational to trust them. And he says, well, why not? All knowledge is based on trusting experiences. If we say to the mystic, you can't trust your experience, we're applying a kind of double standard because we can say, you know, we can trust our ordinary sensory experiences, but you can't trust your mystical experiences. What's the difference? These are both experiences we can't prove. Mm. And one of the things that's, uh, you know, most striking about mystical experiences is that for people who've had them, even afterwards, what they experience seemed to them more real than everyday experience, mm. you know. So yeah, I can um, attest to that. <laughs> for yeah. Sure. Well, maybe I could learn from your insights. Yeah. <laughs> Completely sober. I've never done ayahuasca either, for the record, yet. But <laughs> right. All right. You've had sober, sober mystical yeah, experiences. Yeah, quite a few. That's Incredible. why. Through meditating a lot? Through or meditating, just... through being, you know, hiking, just cutting off technology for a bit and just going deep. So, I mean, yeah, it's not like I want to brag about it. It's kind of just like that's kind of how I see, you know, our evolution is more trusting these mystical experiences because they are experiences that I find are more grounding than what we know of quote unquote reality. So <laughs> And can you describe like what you felt you uncovered in those experiences? Sure. Or? Yeah. I mean, I've uh, had quite a few. I guess one of them recently I was hiking through the woods and I uh literally could hear and feel a tree exhale. And it was like a human exhaling. It was like a deep like sigh <laughs> and and it sounds crazy. I can't believe I'm telling my listeners this, but I kind of like inhaled that oxygen and I, I will never be the same after that experience. Like there was so much wisdom and uh, truth in that moment and I can't quite explain it or put words to it, but it was quite a profound experience, mystical experience. Uh, so that's, just, that's one of them, but yeah. <laughs> Yeah, so I do think there's a real need, you know, I mean, there's a lot of crazy stuff going on at the moment, and there's all sorts of reasons for that. But I think, you know, part of it might be this, I think people feel they either have to trust science and give up their spiritual urges, or they have to, you know, trust the spiritual urges and give up science and rationality. I think, you know, what we need is a way mm -hmm. of bringing these two together. And I think that's what the panpsychist approach gives us. It doesn't say there are two realms. It doesn't say the consciousness or the spiritual stuff, if you want to go there, is, is outside mm -hmm. of the physical world. It says these are just two mm -hmm. sides of the same coin. So that's what's really attractive. It gives us a sort of unified, elegant picture of the universe that leaves nothing out. So what's next for you? I know you just came out with this awesome book. Are you going to be writing another one anytime soon, taking uh, an ayahuasca journey anytime soon? Just kidding. <laughs> what's next on your horizon? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so my mom might be listening. But... Yeah, well, at the moment it's been just doing a lot, lot, lot of writing things and doing a, a lot of interviews and stuff and battling on Twitter. You know, just really the reaction to the book has been fascinating so there's been a number of reviews and but what's happened is because as i say this stuff is getting taken much mm -hmm. more seriously in academic philosophy there are certain senior well-known philosophers mm -hmm. who don't like this <laughs> and have been really kicking off complaining in a quite high profile in a quite extraordinary way not sort of mm -hmm. calmly arguing just a lot mm -hmm. of this is on twitter <laughs> you know i think it's so unprofessional it's so because I've heard so many stories of young, very bright graduate students who kind of get bullied and laughed out of working on this stuff. So really, I'm enthused by that reaction because it's happening because things are changing and this stuff is getting taken seriously. And I was at a conference a few years ago where it was the situation is they have 10 younger philosophers and 10 older philosophers. And this one was on consciousness. And at the end of the conference, the 10 younger philosophers sat on a panel and they told the older philosophers and the audience, you know, so the generation, get, you know, how things had changed. And what we wanted to say was, there's a lot more people challenging materialism. It's not status quo anymore. Mm -hmm. And people didn't like it. You know, there's, there's a strong reaction. So part of what I, you know, is calmly responding to all that and um, trying to challenge the the silly objections that I'm saying electrons have existential angst or something. And, you mm -hmm. know, so that's a large part of it. 
so I guess apart from that, I'm going to come back to some academic work for a little bit. So one, one thing I've been working on is quantum mechanics, the foundations of quantum. There's going to be a volume with Oxford University Press coming out on um, quantum mechanics and consciousness. And my contribution to that is I think this really needs to change how we think about science as a whole. Because I think we need to go to thinking of consciousness as a data point in its own right. You know, I think people think, what's the job of science? It's to account for the data of observation and experiment. Once you've done that, job done. But I think there's something else we know is real, namely subjective experience, our own consciousness. And I think if we have a theory in physics, that's part of the obligation that you have to show that your theory is compatible with the reality of consciousness. Because consciousness is real. So if your theory is not compatible with it, your theory can't be true. So I've applied this to interpretations of quantum mechanics that, you know, quantum mechanics is one of our most successful scientific theories. You know, all of our modern technology is based on it. The trouble is no one knows what the hell it's telling us about reality. One of the more controversial views is what's called wave function monism, that reality just consists of a field in very, very high dimensional space. And what I try to show is that that view Although it fits well with the physics and the observations, it doesn't really fit well with the reality of human consciousness. And so that gives us some reason to doubt it. There's so much irony when you ask a philosopher <laughs> what they're going to be philosophizing about. <laughs> okay, I'll just, I'll just say this briefly. So yeah, so, so one of the, in my very experimental final chapter, I talk about the implications for lived human experience. And one view I tentatively explore is the idea that particles might have a kind of free will. Because I think for people who believe in human free will, one of the problems with that view is it tends to be the view that it's free will is something magical and mysterious that just pops up in human beings and is absent from the rest of the universe. But if we could have a picture of the world where actually in some simple form, free will is is there at the base, is in particles, is in all of matter, then we can be a bit more comfortable accepting human free will as not something special. It's not human exceptionalism. You know, we're just part of what exists in the universe more generally. So I sketch out this view in very loose experimental terms. What I've been trying to do more recently is work that out in a more rigorous academic paper. So that's what I'm kind of working on at the moment. Maybe it won't work out, you know, but it's good to try these things out and see if they make sense. Absolutely. If you can explain how particles have free will that sounds like i would love to read that so (laughs) see how it goes yeah definitely (laughs) and i'd love your book i'm gonna put a link to your book galileo's error foundations for a new science of consciousness in the show notes on artofhumanity.io thank you so much for joining me philip brilliant thanks jessica it's been really good chatting i've learned a lot thanks for having me on You made it to the end of this podcast. This means the world to me. I hope you enjoyed our conversation. Feel free to hop on over to my podcast website, artofhumanity.io, for show notes or past interviews. You can also message me on social media. I'm on Instagram, Twitter, and LinkedIn. My name is Jessica Ann, and my handle is beingishuman. That's B-E-I-N-G-I-S-H-U-M-A-N. I'd love to hear from you and learn more about what you've enjoyed from this episode. If you really love this podcast, I'd highly appreciate it if you went on Apple Podcasts right now and left a review. It helps way more than you know. You can also share this episode with two of your friends who you think would enjoy it. Let's get the Art of Humanity movement going. Thank you for listening. Until the next episode, evolve your business with the Art of Humanity. Listen, explore, evolve.